so let me connect this to compilers since we're going to talk about some interesting computer science stuff. Well, no, I mean, it's, uh, it's going to be about Bitcoins, but I'm legitimately going to connect it to compilers. The technology that is Bitcoin mining is also relative to, uh, related to compilers. <laughs> That's true. Exactly. That's my point. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay. Um, why does this do this? Like a uh, keynote. If you close a. Yeah, that's my that's my uh, Czechoslovakia connection. <laughs> All right, so what did we talk about when I, you know, we were just talking five minutes beginning class or something last time about Bitcoins. What do you guys know about Bitcoins? Cryptocurrency. Okay, cryptocurrency. Okay, so basically it's a non-physical uh, hash-based currency. It's on the internet. What's a hash? One way one way cipher. Okay, so it takes an arbitrary input and spits out a fixed size output. That's a hash. <coughs> now, something that's important about hashes is that they are not reversible. So when you encrypt something as a hash, you cannot decrypt it. The only way you can see if something matches is by encrypting something else. So if I want to, if let's say I hash a password, so I have a password stored as a hash, I can't decrypt that. I can't crack that password by decrypting the hash. Instead, what I have to do is I have to guess what the password is, hash that, and match the hashes. Does that make sense? So that's that's basically how a hash works. Now, um, in the so let's kind of talk about bitcoins a little bit from a banking perspective. So the you know the uh, Internet is the boss of the Bitcoin, if you will. So there's not like a central um, location. So Bitcoin advocates would call places like the United States government the evil ones because they control the U.S. dollar and they what they do just can print more money and stuff like that. So they don't like the, f the fact of somebody else being in control. I'm not sure I buy into that because I think it might nest might be a necessary evil. Well, I guess time will tell. Um, but in any case, so like if you're at a gas station or something like that and you swipe your credit card. It might be like Chase Bank processing that or something like that, right? And there's some bank that has a zillion computers that's going to process that. Well, with Bitcoins, you don't have that. There's aren't, there, there isn't a centralized um, kind of conglomerate for processing Bitcoin-based transactions. So if you buy a pair of sneakers online from a retailer that accepts Bitcoins, somebody has to process that transaction, just as if you would sw swipe their credit card. So that's where Bitcoin mining comes in. Since all Bitcoin transactions are... Uh, essentially giant math problems, because it's, it's, it's very cryptography-based, okay? They're all giant math problems. What you basically have is a whole bunch of computers working together to solve these math problems to validate a transaction. Does that make sense? Now, part of the issue with this is our computers aren't fast enough. Um, so this kind of comes down to a... Um, uh, Let's, let's, let's talk a little, forget about Bitcoins for a second. Let's just talk about technology and see how much you know about your own computers. Uh, so how many of you have what you consider to be a pretty good gaming rig type computer that you've built? Okay. Um, so what do we have? Uh, uh, Intel, how many of you are using Intel processors? Okay. So uh, what, a Core i7? Quad core? Okay. All right. What about graphics cards? So how many of you spent at least three hundred dollars in your graphics card? Okay, who spent at least five hundred dollars in your graphics card? Who spent at least seven hundred dollars in the graphics card? Okay, so you're like the five to six hundred dollar range. Okay. Huh? Well, so so now the question is, how many quarters does your graphics card have? How many? 2880. It's almost 3,000 cores. 
So we think of an uh, Intel i7 with four <laughs> cores as being a powerhouse processor, right? <laughs> Yet now you have this ATI or this uh, um, NVIDIA graphics card with 3,000 cores. Well, why doesn't your Intel processor have 3,000 3, cores in it? Okay, so what's a core? A core is a logical unit. So one core equals one logical unit of work. So that means that a uh, one, that your general com computer, your generalistic processor, your Intel i7 that has a quad core, can physically do four things at once. With something called hyper-threading, it can sort of kind of do eight things at once. Sort of kind of. It's something that deals with pipelining. Um, but your graphics card that has 3,000 cores and it can do 3,000 things at once. Well, that's good because our games have zillions and zillions of things happening all over the screen, right? Now, when you think about your Intel processor, um, it's handling general problems. So it's much more powerful. Each of those individual cores in your Intel processor knows how to do a lot more magic tricks than the individual cores in your graphics card. Your individual cores in your graphics card basically know how to do floating point math. That's what they do. Really, really, really well. Okay? But that's it. They don't know how to do all this other crap that your generalistic pro uh, uh, Intel processor knows how to do. Now, would you agree that some of the stuff, when you're using computers, some of the stuff that you might be working on uh, does involve generalistic computing? So you would not be able to solve, uh, you know, you can't just, well, you might say, well, why don't we just have our graphics, our GPU, the graphics processing unit, why isn't that just replace our Intel processor? It doesn't know how to do enough magic tricks to solve all the problems. But would you agree that many of the things that we do inside of our programs, our general programs, is math stuff? And who's good at doing math stuff? The GPU, the graphics card. So there's a technology called OpenCL. And OpenCL is actually built into many modern day compilers. Um, uh, where it takes some of the number crunching aspect of the compiler and offloads it onto the GPU. Now, from our perspective, when we compile stuff, nothing takes longer than, you know, a, a second or two to compile, right? But uh, how many of you in, in here have ever um, uh, compiled your own Linux kernel? So you installed Linux on a machine and then decided to update to the newest kernel, which is the core of the operating system, and decided to compile that yourself. Okay, well, you can do that, <laughs> first of all. And uh, compiling your own Linux kernel very well, depending on what, you know, what you're compiling into it, what libraries you're linking to it, could take an hour. Imagine compiling, and that's by today's processing power. Um, I, uh, way, 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 way back when this was the, a new distribution, it was called Gen 2 Linux. And one of the cool things about Gen 2 Linux was that you can compile the entire distribution. I mean, who wants to just stick a DVD in and hit install? When you can literally build the bootstrap yourself and create, I mean, you, you literally built the entire operating system from scratch, and it took like a day. Okay? It, would, it would take a day to compile. And imagine that if you had one little error in that, at the end of that day, what would happen? It's like, oh, crap. <laughs> Make space clean. Because <laughs> that, that erased all the files to just spend a day doing. Then go back and do what? Let's build it again. Wait another day to see if it works out. So not all com compilations happen instantaneously. That's just what we are used to, right? So this OpenCL technology is built into a lot of modern compilers. Apple started using it first, but uh, the .NET languages all use this type of thing as well. So OpenCL is a technology for utilizing your GPU, that's your graphics cards processor, for certain operations rather than your CPU. So this all comes down to using the right tool for the job, right? Your GPU is really good at doing math, so rather than bogging your CPU down with math stuff, let's have the GPU do that stuff so that the CPU can do stuff that the GPU can't. That's the concept of OpenCL. Okay, so in any case, Back to the Bitcoin mining concept. Bitcoin mining is the act of validating transactions of Bitcoins. 
So just like somebody slides their credit card, when somebody purchases something with a Bitcoin, that, 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 that needs to be validated. That is, validate the transaction, deliver the funds, and remove the funds from the wallets. Even the wallets are uh, hashes. So when somebody has their, their I mean, because you, you don't carry around digital Bitcoin or real Bitcoins, except for that one rich guy over in uh, Europe somewhere. I had like $14 million worth of Bitcoins and he decided to, to mint them. Yeah, I guess he ended up, it was all over the news about three months ago. I guess he ended up being some sort of drug lord or something like that. They, they raided this guy's like penthouse and he said, just piles of, of gold minted Bitcoin all over the floor and stuff like that. I bet you there was probably some illegal drugs there as well. Um, yeah, that was probably a pretty funny scene. They probably just filmed it and put it on the new Miami Vice. Um, <coughs> but in any case, Bitcoins, there isn't a physical representation. So you store them inside of a wallet. Well, your wallet is a computer program that lives on the internet, and each person has a unique hash value that links them to their wallet. So if somehow you, you lose that link, so you need to back it up in the cloud or something, you lose that link, you lose all your Bitcoins. Nobody else gets them. It's not like somebody else found them. Unless somebody else broke into your wallet and transferred, you know, paid themselves, you can send and receive within the wallet. But, you know, it's just you would lose it. It's like losing a pointer to something. You can no longer reclaim it, okay? So your, your wallet's gone. Um, but in any case, somebody needs to validate those transactions, and that's where the Internet, us, come in. Well, it takes a lot of horsepower to do this because there's thousands and thousands and thousands of transactions every single day. We don't recognize how popular Bitcoins have actually become, especially over in Europe. In Europe, Bitcoins are actually used quite a bit now. The United States, you know, you can't go into McDonald's and use Bitcoin, but I bet you maybe in the next two years you will be able to. Really? Yeah. I mean, won't that be, wouldn't that be neat? Interestingly, at least, in interesting at least, where you can go into uh, uh, McDonald's and a Big Mac is, you know, 0. 0.00032 Bitcoins. Because right now, Bitcoins are worth like 500 US dollars, one Bitcoin. So the, there would have to be some, I mean, it would be weird, right? Uh, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> they would have to round the price of a Big Mac for the, the Bitcoin equivalent. Uh, keep the change, right? Okay, so in any case, um, yeah, in any case, we need comp computing power in the center in order to actually handle these transactions, validate them and actually make them happen. And that's where this, uh, this mining concept comes in. Now, it's actually quite expensive. So like right now, I have a miner running and this is using my GPU. So this is an OpenCL based technology. If I was just using my CPU, which the miners don't even support anymore, I would probably be, so this, this is 34.3 uh, million hashes per second. Okay, it's just doing a bunch of math problems, calculating hashes, all right? And it's using two different graphics cards. So this is a high-end MacBook Pro. So this is the onboard graphics that's built into the motherboard. And then since this is a gaming laptop, if you will, here's the NVIDIA GeForce, blah, blah, blah. Hey, I'm really good for a laptop, but don't try to play anything super heavy on it because this isn't anywhere near as good as a desktop. Um, you know, graphics card. So in any case, this is the speed that I'm contributing. Now, if you were just to do this on your own, just do... Uh, um, you know, mining on your own, the amount of time it would take you, because you basically get paid. Somebody gets, like, when you swipe a credit card, somebody gets a transaction fee, right? Visa, MasterCard, whoever gets, gets a cut of that. Well, when you help with these transactions, you're getting a cut of a Bitcoin, fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a Bitcoin. Now, the problem is, is that with uh, credit cards, each transaction has its own cut. With Bitcoins, you contribute for a period of time, and once you hit a certain threshold, you get your cut. So usually the threshold is set at one Bitcoin for payment. Well, the amount of time it would take me, running at this speed, to generate one Bitcoin in earned co contribution, probably about a thousand years. Okay? Um, I might actually be underestimating that. So a long time. All right. <laughs> so, so what people have done is they've created these pools. So see this thing, I've, I'm in this thing called slush pool right here. 
So there's all these different pools that are out there. For di Here's the Bitcoin ones, here's Litecoin, and there's this thing, uh, Doge coins. Doge coins. Okay. Well, anyways, Slush is the one that, that I'm using. So this is a conglomerate of, let's call it a, um, a million people. Okay, and that was the website I had up uh, back here. So this is located in the, in the Czech Republic, Bitcoin CZ. Um, and uh, let's see, does it do it say it on the front page here? I think they give some statistics about what they're doing. Um, yeah, so this gives us all the information. So Bitcoin's ordinary, ordinarily only ever created in chunks of 25 at a time, with the whole 25 paid to a single person. But, like I said, it would take a thousand years to earn one. Okay? Furthermore, the race to get to 25 Bitcoin prize is a given block in a highly competitive world. So, if you're one guy using a crappy graphics card, you're not competitive. Okay? You're not going to win that race. So, people pull together. So, this particular slush pool thing... So our server gives user blocks a very low difficulty to solve. Each, each solution found is registered as one share. Uh, occasionally, a solution will happen to also meet the full strength difficulty requirements of the Bitcoin network, resulting in a successful 25 Bitcoin minting. So that means 25 Bitcoins were just created and we now get our share. And then I, as being a member of this, get a share of those 25 Bitcoins based on my contribution. <laughs> okay, so for example, I have at this time earned point zero 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 five eight two four bitcoins, like maybe a quarter. <laughs> not no no, it's not. It's like eight cents probably. Yeah, not a lot, not a lot. Okay. Now, so part of the issue here is, okay, and, and on top of that, you need to think about the other thing. Right now, Concordia is footing the bill for this, right? Okay, I got this thing tethered to the wall. Well, I can, if you come up here, and my laptop's hot right now. My graphics cards are working, okay? So we're going to call this a really, really, really slow speed. So I'm contributing almost nothing. Uh, my iMac at home, um, using just its graphics card, does 170 millihashes, mega hashes per second. So a lot faster than this. When really this is the better computer from a technology perspective, just the graphics card is, is made to fit inside of a portable computer. But now this is considered to be really, really slow as well as very memory hungry, or um, uh, power hungry. So this is, let's say that in a, at this speed, Okay, at this speed, let's say that I'm generating, in terms of U.S. dollars, uh, let's say $3 a month, okay, for my little fraction, fraction, fraction of a Bitcoin. Let's say I'm, I'm earning the equivalent of $3 a month. The elect that's this running 24-7. Now, the electricity cost at like 15 cents per kilowatt hour is probably going to cost me like 30 bucks. okay? So I'm paying the power company $27. Because I'm only making three. This is discounting my power bill that I wasn't going to spend anyways if I wasn't going to do this. Make sense? What? I have an idea. Find me next week to get my laptop in. Yeah, that would actually be funny. One half second. So. It is theoretically possible that you would come in and get from the right away. Mm-hmm. Just be the right away. Yeah. That would be awesome. Boom. No. They have these things called ASICs, which are, I forgot exactly what it stands for, but basically it's a microchip specifically designed for doing hashing. Rather than using your GPU to do the math and kind of bending it to your will, it's creating something even more special purpose. So like Joey said, the reason that graphics cards have so many cores in them is because they're very special purpose cores. Each one does a little tiny bit of work dealing with math. But what I'm telling you about these ASICs is they do even more specialized work. They only know how to hash Bitcoins. Well, they don't know how to hash. Let's just say that. So, for instance, 
I went on to Amazon and I ordered a, it was like, I think it was 22 bucks. And it was called, uh, um, I think it was called Ant Miner or something like that. So it was one of these ASICs. And this guy was advertised to do two giga hashes <coughs> per second. So a $22 USB thing was doing, okay, this is, what is this? This is point, this is point three four giga hashes, right? Point three four. Yeah. No, this is point zero three four giga hashes. It's just power hungry right now, where I can use the power of a USB port to do two giga hashes. But this is where the funny story comes in. Okay. So I started this thing up, and it was at two giga hashes. And let me, uh, here's the uh, overclockable is the advertising point. Okay, I'm now. I know, well, here's this thing running on my machine at home. What does that say? 3.04 giga hashes. Now that was solid, like that. When I woke up, it was a smoke alarm. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this was a device meant to do two giga hashes safely. And I was chugging along doing two giga hashes safely. I'm like, oh, this thing's overclockable. <laughs> so, so I decided to mess with the settings a little bit. So when the uh, smoke detector goes off around four in the morning, I still the TV in our bedroom. We have a big screen TV right above my iMac, so like my desk is below the. So I sit there and okay, no, but the TV was still on. You see this black smoke billowing across the TV. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so the iMac, I had my, my USB thing plugged into the back of it, okay? It's not <laughs> This thing was like melted. And you know, this is four in the morning, so I'm not totally coherent yet, so I run back there no. and just grab it and yank it out. And I have like molten circuit board all over my hand. I burn the crap out of my thumb. <laughs> I don't, I have it, I'm still at home. Well, I'm actually, I'm returning it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is an effective product. <laughs> thing lasted like 12 hours-ish <laughs> before it lit on fire. Are you going to return, like, the pool of plastic? Yeah, no, I boxed it back up. <laughs> I already have five more in order. <laughs> so, in any case, um... Yeah, actually, the Mac was fine. Really? Yeah, all the fire was coming off the back of the heat sink in this thing. Like the plastic right around the USB port was like a little melty, but it's the USB port still works. <laughs> okay, so. Go ahead. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, now, now, what's what's kind of interesting here? So when you go online, so so let's 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 discuss this for a second. So let's say I'm at two giga hashes per second. Two giga hashes per second is probably going to make me about a quarter a day. Okay, but a lot less energy use, especially if Concordia is put in the bill, right? Okay. So that means you'll make a little bit more than a buck a week. It's pretty solid. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's like fifty. You make you you'll make like sixty five. I think it's sixty eight bucks a year. I think at two giga hashes. That's if you're not. That's if you're not paying for the electricity. Okay. So what do places do? Well, one of these things isn't good enough. So they sell these USB hubs that are spaced enough, where you just line up these ASICs on there. Okay. Like these 40 point, 40 port USB, USB hubs, you plug it in a single USB thing and they're powered. 
And so you have two giga hashes times 40. Okay, so you're doing 80 giga hashes from a, on a single USB port on a single computer. Well, now, now on top of that, that's just if you're using these little tiny uh, amp miner type things. There's some specific kind of blade uh, setups um, that are set up. You, you can do, you know, a, a tera. You can do a, a, a tera hash a second. Now, so what's kind of interesting about this? Now, beyond that, so, you know, I all, so I lit my bedroom on fire. <laughs> kind of the starting point. So now you have this new industry that's been created. You can maintain your own hardware. This is almost like a cloud computing. Well, it is cloud computing, but it's, a, it's another use of cloud computing. So I can maintain my own hardware and do this myself and burn my room down. <laughs> or you can subscribe to a service. For example, um, here's a site called Bitcoin Cloud Mining. And what you do is you subscribe on a yearly contract. So for $100 a year, you will have eight giga hashes per second. Constantly going. You don't have to manage the hardware or anything. They just do it. Okay? Now, this particular site is doing 1.2 petahashes per second. So I think the way they, I think the, the, the situation here is you have some place. They probably financed this by selling these contracts. So they probably actually told you we're giving you a portion of our thing, but they had to wait until they had enough subscribers to really buy the equipment. So they lied to you. I mean, I guess. But they have some giant warehouse with tons and tons and tons of probably specialized computers with all this equipment hooked up to it, just doing hash after hash after hash after hash. They're doing a total of 1.2 petahashes per second. Now, what becomes interesting with that, well, you pay them like $100 a year if you want to do the beginner one. And what that does is it shares 8 giga hashes per second of their 1.2 petahashes with you. So you get the money and then they give you, they charge you like a 3% management fee or something like that. Um, so now, so let me, let me, let me show you something here. It's kind of a uh, interesting, uh, which one of these is, um, I need to find a, a decent calculator on here. Well, I can just kind of tell you at the high level. So this particular one that's doing 1.2 petahashes. Um, we sat down and kind of did the math and uh, what, what the power consumption of that would be. Their power bill per year for that is right around $750,000. Okay? But... They're earning enough Bitcoins by today's market value of like 500 bucks per Bitcoin to be worth almost $2 million for a net profit of $1.3 million. So $1.3 million. But you have to be able to do 1.2 peta hashes. So you have giga hash, then you have tera hash, then you have peta hash. Okay? So that's a thousand. So that's that's a thousand terahashes, which is a thousand gigahashes. Okay, it's a lot. It's a thousand thousand. Point two. All right. So this play, so it becomes almost a real life investment, but in a highly, highly, uh, um, let's call it uh, like here. Market price right now is five hundred and sixteen dollars. Is one bitcoin in U.S. dollars? Yesterday it was four eighty. Three months ago, it was 1,200. Three years ago, it was 20. What's it going to be in two weeks? It's highly speculative, right? Yeah, so point is, this is not a way to get rich. It could be. More than likely, you'll lose everything. But it's a very interesting computer science problem, utilizing different technologies. So it kind of shows us kind of the balancing of uh, how can we use our hardware to maximize problems through distributed computing and things like that. Um, so, I don't know, it, it, it really is just, just fascinated me how this works. Now, what's interesting is we've created a market out of nothing. So, think about like the price of gold. People speculate on gold. So, God 
made a finite amount of gold, right? So, you know, you, you can, you can, yeah, it's a Christian worldview. Okay? God made a finite amount of gold. So, they're not making any more of this. Just like land, just like real estate. They're not making more land. Earth is what it is, and we got so much land. So, these things have values associated with them, right? That value goes up and goes down, blah, blah, blah. Well, some random person who's never revealed themselves created this idea of a cryptocurrency. It's not real. But we've given value to it. We've decided that Bitcoins have value for no good reason other than you have a bunch of people who are willing to barter their goods for Bitcoins. Isn't that fascinating? Well, but at least it's physical. But yeah, yeah. Somebody decided what a U.S. dollar should look like, and then we went to a printing press and printed it, and then we issued it out there. And as we print more and more of it, it becomes worth less and less relative to everybody else's currency, but it's still worth plenty in the United States, right? Well, but, but, like, we still assign a certain value to the one dollar bill. Mm -hmm. The exact same amount of cost can be twenty dollars. Mm -hmm. So it's just what we assign to that particular piece of paper. What's kind of fascinating about this, I mean, you're right. What's kind of fascinating about this, though, it's kind of like the, somebody initially stumbled upon gold, right? And at that point, they didn't know how rare it was. They just know, hey, I found this shiny thing. Um, well, then, as people continue to look for it, they found out it's pretty rare. Well, in this case, somebody stumbled upon a hash <laughs> called Bitcoin. And now we've decided it has value. It's, it, it's not real. So at what point do the lines blur between the internet and real physical objects. <laughs> right. Doesn't actually exist. Right. So you go and put on your uh, your your VR goggles. And your VR goggles, you're looking through the eyes of an avatar who happens to have a digital Xbox One. We could play all the games on the digital Xbox One, but it's not a real Xbox One. <clears throat> How many of you have seen the movie Thirteenth Floor? <coughs> have you seen it? It's actually kind of a cool movie, um, especially from a computer science perspective. Um, I think I think it's the movie. It's the the one where they have virtual reality, right? Yeah, VR one. So. Uh, well, okay, so here, no, here's, here's the deal. Here's the deal. So, in 13th floor, these people, so it's kind of almost matrixy. These people believe that, uh, well, these people are creating the technology to live in a virtual world. Okay, so on the 13th floor of this building, these people are creating, um, you know, they're specializing in VR. So, similar to, you know, now the, the big news lately has been the VR stuff. Okay. Uh, in fact, uh, for those of you who are interested, I, I think I've kind of settled on the, the topic for the um, special topics class next semester. Uh, it's, it's going to be it's, it's, it's going to be Game of Thrones. No, we're actually going to do Google programming. So that's going to include Android, App Engine, um, Google Glass. Programming, uh, as well as Google is coming out with a VR API for um, the a couple of the different technology VR goggles. We're going to try to get our hands on one of those. So I'm calling it Google programming because we're going to use some different technologies, all that Google produces. Okay, Pokemon Master, exactly. So that's the 390 class in the uh, fall. So if you're interested in that, sign up for that. Oh, that, that you find Pokemon with Google Glass? Yeah, I guess that's true. Right, right, right. Okay, so in any case, um, so that's what the topic's going to be uh, for that. Uh, what, what was I was talking about something right before that? What was the topic we were talking about? Oh, 13-4, right. So the, these people 
are creating technology so that, you know, you put the weird thing on the neural network on your head and, and it plugs you into a virtual world. And now you think, but you feel it's real. Okay? So, um, now, uh, cover your ears if you don't want to hear the punchline. Okay? It is a cool, it is a cool movie. You want to see this. What they find out is they're actually in a virtual world. So, another world had created VR, which had these people in it, and the virtual world created the technology for a virtual world. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, yeah, it was, it's, it's, it's pretty fascinating. Um, so, w worth watching from a computer science perspective. Um, but, you know, in, in any case, it's a, a kind of an interesting ethical uh, thing that I, you know, I've, been, I've been thinking about with this uh, Bitcoin stuff is we've always given value to physical objects. Yet now we're giving value to digital objects. But we've really done this for a while, right? How many of you play video games? A lot of us, right? How many of you have a game and you think you're successful at it because the amount of gold you have in the game is high? That currency is only good in that game. So if you're a World of Warcraft player and you have lots of gold, great. So you can buy lots of World of Warcraft stuff, right? Um, you know, your character is a certain level. If you're a, uh, a StarCraft II player, your, your rank is your currency, right? You know, how good you are compared to everybody else. Uh, so these are currencies, but only, you know, you can't go out and buy a pair of shoes with your StarCraft ranking. Well, <laughs> no, at, oh, good point. Why not? If you found somebody who was interested, you know, if, if StarCraft rating was transferable, you know, if Mark could be really, really good at StarCraft and I sucked at it, but I wanted to just be better, <laughs> he can somehow transfer his ranking to me and that makes me automatically better or at least look better on paper, I guess. Um, I mean, I guess that's the real world thing, right? There's plenty of rich people who aren't good at making money, but they somehow got money. So, uh, you know, their bank account makes them look like they're good at making money. Um, you know, in, in any case, it's, it's kind of fascinating to me that the world has begun embracing this concept of a currency that doesn't physically exist having value. Just, but how can it be sustaining? How many of you think Bitcoin is going to end up being su successful? Okay, you, you, th you think it's still growing. Okay. Okay. Uh, any of you think it's going to be a giant flop? I don't, I don't know if it'll be a giant flop, but I think there will be a big transition. Okay. So basically, right now, all it is is people have the money to buy the thing that they want Would you agree that the selling point for a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin is that there isn't a central organization in charge of it? That's their selling point, correct? Okay. But since it relies on computing power to uh, deal with transactions, won't there eventually be a rise in central locations that have like you know, places like this? You know, conglomerates that have built power and power and power, and they become the trendsetters, right? The people who are handling the transactions, don't they become the power, the decision makers? So is it really any different, is the point. In the early days of the United States, in the early days of America, you know, people bartered with all sorts of different stuff until we agreed on a currency, right? But even now, you could still, you can go into a place and you can trade a, a diamond for something in a pawn shop and that kind of stuff, right? There's different things that we value, but we have a, a standard currency. So but the question is, is Bitcoin really any different? Or are we just saying, well, instead of it being any individual country that's already existing, already existing we're going to just go more corporate and say survival the fittest. You know, whichever 
cloud place becomes the biggest conglomerate, the one that people rely on the most, or the group of five or six of them that are doing the most computing, you know, the system doesn't run without them. So now we need them. Aren't they controlling it? Go ahead. I'd say that's really not all that much different because I mean, you can go your whole life and never use cash once. Mm -hmm. It's all like somewhere you have this money that you never right. be able to do it. It's like in time, you just transfer, but they don't physically transfer any money to the other place. It's, it's just numbers. Business. Yeah, it's, it's numbers, it's right? It's the same thing. Like you can go and get cash with it, but I mean, how long before you can go and get cash with this? And it's exactly the same. Yeah, I mean, the reality is like you, if you have a million dollars in your bank, and you walk to, uh, you know, into Grafton's Harris Bank or something like that, um, you know, there's a pretty decent chance they're not going to have just a million dollars in hand. Just hand you. So. I think the anger is the bank. Is the... <laughs> money here, where would go? <laughs> this is, you're the bank. Um, you have money to go to the money store. So is it as different as it sounds? So why is this going to be better? Okay. Okay. Meaning, meaning what? Meaning that people think that they want to invest in the right now as we crash. Okay. So you think that will crash, and what will eventually happen? Like Bitcoin's a deal now, but they won't like replace all currencies. Okay. Because I think you can get like more of a cryptocurrency just like a tiny unit. Yeah, that's been better with a lot of places than that. Mm -hmm. And part of the issue in my mind is that it doesn't seem to be real usable. You know, like you can't go in because of its current value and kind of what you're saying with the speculation. Because of the current trade value, one Bitcoin is worth 500 US dollars. I mean, to buy a Big Mac would be like some fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a Bitcoin. So and when you, when you, yeah, you know, when, yeah, when you go into McDonald's, you look up the menu and it's what, $4.99 for a Big Mac value or $5.99, whatever it is, you know, something like that. You know, that means something to us, right? So six bucks, six bucks for a Big Mac value meal. You know, we don't, human beings don't like these like really cryptic looking, uh, oh, Big Mac value meal, it's 0. .0004 Bitcoins. I'm sure they'll probably just yeah, they'll say that the Bitcoin will be the equivalent of the thousand dollar bill. You know, yeah, they have a bit or whatever. Yeah, they'll give, they'll give up names for his, for micro denominations. Well, I think part of the thing is there's so much speculation. So one day it's like you know point zero zero four, and next thing it's like mm -hmm. half a bit. Sure. Uh, related to that, how many of you saw the um, uh, movie In Time? Yeah. Yeah. Justin Timberlake was in it. Yeah, it was actually it was actually a good movie. In that movie, the currency is time. So, um, you know, I think it was like at around twenty one years old or something like that. Your clock starts, and uh, you have so you have a number of hours left. And when your hours count down, you die. So when you work, what are you buying? You're, you're being paid in time. You buy a cup of coffee, it costs you three minutes. Time. See what I'm saying? Yeah, it's, it's actually kind of interesting. So you have the real, the rich people are people who have unlimited time. Everybody looks 21 years old in the whole movie. So there's people that might be hundreds and hundreds of years old that have zillions and zillions of hours of time, years of time, um, banked up. So they can do whatever they want. And then you have the other people, the the steerage, you know, that at any point in time they have 45 minutes left in their life. So, <laughs> so, I mean, like, look, I, I got I to gotta get to an ATM. I got no time. <laughs> you know, robbing people means taking their time. Well, so the movie's actually a pretty, yeah, the movie's actually a pretty, uh, a pretty cool movie. Uh, um, I think definitely, definitely worth watching. Um, but in any case, uh, it, it's really an, an interesting ethical computing uh, type of thing we're going through in the world. Um, you know, it, it's utilizing our technology. If we didn't have the computing power that we have today, we wouldn't be able to support a currency like this. So, go ahead. I think what this might end up being is it will end up being pretty similar to what the currency we have now, but I think it would be used more for international stuff because you don't have to convert to anything. If you're buying something from overseas, you get money. 
exchanges, you kind of see that already with PayPal. Like, if you want to purchase something from a site that is from a foreign country and they aren't really intending to sell to you, uh, you could just log into PayPal. Most places accept PayPal. They convert it all automatically. Yeah. Now here, here's a here's an interesting point. This is this is again a Christian worldview, but also almost conspiracy theory. Um, so I'm Lutheran. I was born Jewish, but I'm Lutheran now. And uh, um, Lutherans don't believe in the rapture. You know where, you know. But I'm a big fan of that concept. I read a, a big book series called Left Behind. I just think it makes a great movie. Um, that type of thing. So I tend to think that's the way. It's, I tend to think that's the way it's going to go down. I'm sure. I'm sure uh, we have plenty. You know, Dr. Jastrom could probably. 50 reasons why I'm wrong, but I just think it sounds interesting. But in any case, you know, the the, 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 the rapture as the uh, Christian fiction books kind of depicted is, you know, in one fell swoop, you know, all the believers just disappear off the earth. Okay, so the Left Behind series starts off with this guy in the 747, the half of his passengers are gone. And he's now one of the main series, one of the main characters, because it's like, what would it, what would happen if you were one of them left behind and you had the rise of the Antichrist and all this stuff? But in all these uh, rapture type books, there's always this idea. There's a one world currency, and that's like, you know, the, the, the devil coin. You know, the Antichrist establishes a one world government, a one world currency. So maybe Bitcoin is literally devil's gold, and we're mining it. We <laughs> is that good or bad? Yeah, I'm I'm arguing that it's know your enemy. I was just kind of if we start storing Bitcoin, ship them. Mm -hmm. yeah, I just find it fascinating. Um, but we, we, Bitcoins could not exist unless we had the technology we have today. And then we need people, you know, it had to be some computer science skill set type guy or group that created this concept of Bitcoins. It, it's, a, it's a highly interesting um, computer science problem, this idea of a cryptocurrency. So, and I was just kind of, uh, you know, it's kind of uh, fascinating from the perspective that people like us, computer scientists, are changing the world. Maybe for good, maybe for bad, but, you know, we're the new ninjas. You know, in the old days, you had, you know, conquerors, ninjas and stuff. Well, I mean, I don't know if wizards ever really existed. It's like a... Lord of the Rings thing. Shut but, up. <laughs> but ninjas definitely exist. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> go ahead. Last, last thing. We're out of time. Um, man, so like say in the future you're not going to have a program anymore. It's going to just like tell the computer what you want you to do it. There, people look back at us and be like, oh, those guys are too tight. There's actually research. There's actually research in automatic programming. An artificial intelligence research where you express what you want and it programs it for you. All right. So we're out of time. Uh, I will see everybody a week from today. Correct. Yeah. We have uh, Easter break, so if you're traveling somewhere, make sure you travel safely, um, blah, 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 but there's no class on Friday and there's no class on Monday unless your class starts after 4 p.m. If you have an evening class on Monday, it does meet. Somebody remind me to bring my laptop. All right. <laughs>